Hello, wrestling fans, and welcome back to 10 Count. I'm C. Fall, but on today's edition, I'm talking to a woman who's supposed to get married on NWA and a turn flipped sideways. Mara Diaz Gomez, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing really- Pleasure being here with you. A pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much because if no one knows the backstory to this, me and you have been emailing back and forth, back and forth, like a game of tennis. Where suddenly we have come together and we are here. The ball is in your court, though, and I am so pumped about this because you've done so much in your life that I don't think many people know all the aspects of you. They might see, um, for instance, you instantly look. What a, what, a, what a wonderful hair. I don't have any hair anymore. You know, what a beautiful face. I have an okay face. But then inside that brain, there's so much going on because you've written books. You've interviewed the Twilight cast. Like you've done just so much. But first, recently, you posed for Playboy. Now, yes. what is that like? Because I know for some people, it's an accomplishment of a lifetime. How are you feeling? How does this deal even come together? It's definitely an accomplishment of a lifetime. Um I, I have always dreamed on um, of being on Playboy. It's such an iconic brand, right. you know, and it's it's a huge honor to be able to stand behind that brand and represent Playboy. So I'm definitely really, really happy and really proud. And that opportunity pretty much just stems from a lot of modeling work that I've been doing for maybe the past five years. I live in Hollywood. I moved to Hollywood when I was 21 years old. So I've done a lot here, like you said. And uh, as of recently, I kind of dedicated myself more to modeling and trying to pursue those types of opportunities. And luckily, I got the huge opportunity to be on the cover of Playboy. And here I am. I'm a Playmate now. Oh, man, you get the shirt on and everything. I I love it. I'm representing. You gotta. You gotta. Because, again, that you brought up is a brand. Like whatever mm-hmm. perception you have of of Playboy is one thing, but there's a brand to that company. It's very recognizable. The the bunny, yeah. the name. It's not like oh, what, I'm sorry, what's that company called? Like no, 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 no. There is no mistake <laughs> on what Playboy is and what it is to a lot of people. Um, yeah, and it's we- it's a part of a lot of people's history and and life. You know, I remember I remember the the moment I got my first Playboy. I stole it from my father when I was about nine years old or something. (laughs) So I'm sure everybody has their own stories of how Playboy came into play in their own lives and in their early years or. Yeah. So it's really cool. Well, for a lot of people too, if we want to get even crazier is you go back before there was any internet, you know, Playboy, Playboy was the internet for a lot of people. And randomly, if you could find one, you'd be like, Oh my God, it's it's like, Oh, Oh, the holy grail. You found a Playboy yeah. as, a, as a little boy growing up. Uh, my first one, my father bought me, Sable. WWF legend Sable was on the cover. and I, I was actually like, have that one right here because uh, someone gifted it to me. Amazing. Uh, Sables and Chinas. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I think my dad eventually bought me Chinas too, but then they, dis- <laughs> they disappeared. So I'm not sure where my dad took them. But anyways, <laughs> what? Did he just say that? He did. But yeah, that Playboy, I think, for a lot of people is the beginning of something inside them. And and obviously, it's an accomplishment for a model who gets to be part of this brand forever because it's not like, oh, uh, you're not a former Playboy mate. Like, you are a Playboy mate for life. Exactly. And so. it opens so many new doors and new opportunities in so many areas. Yeah. Like you said, it's it's the fact that it's the one of the most iconic brands in the world. Oh, yeah. 100%, especially in, in America too, probably worldwide. But in America, you think of certain brands, Coca-Cola, you know, you bring up, you know, Nike. Like Playboy is yeah. one of those brands that it's doesn't matter if you drink Pepsi or don't drink Pepsi, you know what Pepsi is. And exactly. same exact thing with Playboy. You know exactly what the brand is and who it is and what it represents. So that's awesome. Though, when I, again, not just beautiful photos. Did you write a book when you were 17? I wrote my first book when I was 16 years old, and then I wrote three books after that. So I've written a total of four novels. So my my. first one that I wrote when I was 16 became a bestseller by the time I was 19. Yeah. To me, that's crazy. Because when I'm 16 years old, I'm driving around getting in trouble with my friends. You're writing a book becoming a bestseller. How does that happen? Well, I, I think that I was always very precocious, and I grew up. I grew up in an environment, in a show business environment, pretty much, because my dad was a writer. He was a writer for television in Brazil. He was one of the most 
iconic soap opera writers in Brazil. Mm. So, and my mom was an actress. So like I grew up in show business. I grew up watching my father writing and my mom acting and just being a part of like TV and film and plays. My father was also a play writer. So I was always backstage at his plays and rehearsals. Um, so I grew up in that environment. So writing was something really natural to me. I thought everybody writes. That's what you do. Writing is, is, is part of life. And uh, I started writing in diaries when I was probably like eight years old. And I wrote every day pretty much until I was 15. So I actually have still all of those. I can always go back and see what happened in sixth grade, what happened in seventh grade, which is <laughs> amazing. Um, where did this trauma begin? Why do I, do I think this way? You know, everything's there. Uh, so I always thought writing was a natural thing. And by the time I was like 11 years old, I already wanted to write a book. I'm glad I didn't. But, you know, early on, I was already doing that. And when I was a kid, like my idea of fun with my friends was writing scripts, uh, performing plays. And that's what we would do pretty much. Like I would write, I would invite all my friends over from school and my cousins and my relatives. And I'd put like plays and films together. I'd edit it myself. So like that was always my personality as a child. That's amazing. So, yeah. And then my father sadly passed away when I was 11 years old. He mm -hmm. died in a car accident. And that pretty much changed uh, the roots of my life. So I became very rebellious, like very early on. I was a very rebellious teenager. Um, and by the time I was 15, I didn't really feel like I fit in in my school. I, was ve I felt very different than everybody else. And I just didn't want to be a part of that environment anymore. And I wanted why did to you feel why did you feel why did you feel different though for the because of the passing of your father? Um, no, I just like I had different interests. I had a different musical taste. I mm -hmm. had a different style. My school was a very um, conservative type of school. Okay. Um, which I think like people were expected to to be the same. You know, being different was not seen as something cool maybe by some people um but i felt uncool in school um and i just felt like i was already ready to start a career by the time i was 15 years old like i mm. remember saying to my mom why do i have to stay in school for four more years like i already know what i'm gonna do and my mom is like what are you gonna do i said i'm gonna be a best-selling author and you know and and the crazy thing is that that actually happened so when i was 15 years old, I actually stopped going to school against my mother's will. I just, I just said, I'm not going anymore. I was that rebellious. Uh, and my mom was, of course, very upset. It was a whole drama at the time. She tried to put me in different schools. I wouldn't go to school. I was just decided that I wanted to be a writer and that's it. And so when I was 16, I started writing this book that pretty much talked about um, the issues that I was facing as a teenager, like my father dying. And then um, I became uh, addicted to drugs. I faced depression. There were lots of things that were going on in my adolescence life. And I wrote about it. And, you know, teenagers really related to it because I was always very honest. Um, and so my book became a bestseller by the time I was 19. So while you're 16 writing this book, you still haven't returned to school? Like, if, for instance, where I live, if you stop going to school, eventually the police will well, come to your house well, or, well, or, or well, um, well. child services will come to your house and say, like, excuse me, talking to your mother, excuse me, um, we're going to take your child away from you because you are no longer putting them in the circumstances they're supposed to be in. Right. So I was expelled from school and then I was homeschooled. OK, so that's what happened. Yeah. Okay. So I did, I did finish high school, but I finished it at home. Okay. And yeah. so the, the idea of being at school, not having a connection to anyone, it felt like. So did you, did you I have, say not, did you have some friends? Say, like, like oh, did, yeah. okay. Because the, I just want to make sure we're painting the picture of what was high school like for you? Because it seems that at least from my perspective, once your father passed away, obviously you become rebellious because you're, because again, that's the structure of life in, in some people's brains. And yet here you are writing a book about your, your struggles. Here you are sharing your story with others. So all that you went through, not wanting to go to school, being you and your mother fighting, obviously all that in the book is written, your, your inspiring mm -hmm. story. But no one really thinks about how the journey of being a, at such a young age, losing your father and that journey of rebellion and then writing a book, 
that could have gone sideways for you. Oh, absolutely. I think I was, I, I, I was privileged in many ways because I come from this family with a background in writing and acting and show business. You know, I would never recommend anybody else taking this path. And I'm very lucky that it worked out for sure. Right. Because you always hear like, oh, honey, my, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. Well, say, I'm leaving Kansas and I'm going to Hollywood. I'm going to be somebody. Yeah. You know right. I, I did that. I, I, I did that too. Yeah. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> I mean, yes. But you're already in Hollywood, so you didn't have to go that far versus someone who moved well, across I came, the I country. Well, I came from Brazil. I came from Rio de Janeiro that's and I moved true. to Hollywood when I was 21 by myself. So oh, yeah, that true. story that's is true. also my story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. But it came out. You know, obviously, some pieces of that worked out for you, but a lot of people, it does not. And you, yes. when you, but when you hear the inspiring story, like, I go back to. I don't know why I thought of her right now. Vanna White, the woman who turns the the letter is on wheel of fortune she you know years ago came to hollywood wanted to be someone be in movies be this and they're like well here's a gig spin spin these these things and show up letters okay yeah and look at her now you know you go through time everyone has a dream and obviously some people accomplish them some people don't but you accomplished a dream of some people though at the time you became like a journalist and mm -hmm. you interviewed the cast of twilight now yes. At the time, while you're doing this, Twilight is not a movie. It is an it's experience. Movie. It's a lifestyle. Like, people are yeah. deep into this. This was a thing for a Absolutely. lot of kids, a lot of adults. So and the funny thing is, that was, that was my first job in Hollywood. So, okay, so I released my book uh, when I was 16, bestseller by 19. Then the success of the book led me to write for lots of different outlets. So by the time I was 19, I was working for the largest newspaper in Brazil. I had my own column. So I became a music journalist at the time I was 19. And I wrote for a number of magazines, like a Spin Magazine, a MTV, VH1, Glamour Magazine, Teen Vogue, like I, I, I had a successful writing career stemming from that book that I wrote in that crazy turmoil when I was 16 years yeah. old. Um, and so by the time I was 21, I had already accomplished a lot. I already had two published books. I, I wrote for the biggest newspaper in the country. I had a segment on MTV. I was doing a lot by the time I was 19. Uh, but I still didn't feel like I fit in. <laughs> so that feeling stayed with me after school. Um, Why do you and think I decided, that is? Um, that's a hard question. I don't. I'm not sure. I know how to answer that. Maybe that feeling will stay with me for the rest of my life. Right. You know. Um. But I still felt that way, and I felt like my future was in Hollywood. And so, by the time I was 21, I did move to Hollywood. <laughs> and I'm gonna be first, somebody. And you did. Yeah. Yeah. And the first job that I got here was the red carpet for for uh new moon i think it was new moon i can't remember which one it was i think it was new moon um let me check my my twilight tattoo hold on oh, oh no. my gosh i oh, know i don't have one okay. that'd be hilarious i was about to die and sad. yeah so that was my first first job in this crazy wild red carpet like you said the, the, the movie was like huge at the time you know fans were crazy about twilight yeah it was like a wild premiere with people screaming their lungs out and that was my first job so did you get to talk to all of them the wolf yeah the vampire everybody. everybody everybody from producer to writer the entire cast and then the next two movies i i also did interviews for so i actually sat down with uh kristen a few times i sat down with robert a few times uh taylor Almost all of them, pretty much. Like, I had the opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one with them. Wow. Again, yeah. you probably have stolen lots of people's dreams of that <laughs> of that moment of, like, so, <laughs> you talk to the, you talk to Twilight people? Oh, my yeah. God, it's so hot in here. So it's, hot in here. Know, it's so funny because I posted a, a photo with Taylor Lautner, and I remember it, it became a news. Like, he was dating this new Brazilian model, and I was like, wow, all I did was post a photo. And that was like the beginning of my Hollywood experience. Oh my, the tabloids already got you. First day on the job. They got you yeah. good with that one. That's hilarious. You also interviewed the Muppets, which I absolutely love the Muppets. The, yeah. To this day, they're my favorite form of entertainment besides professional wrestling. So what was that like? How's that process like? Because I imagine Kermit's a bit of a diva. That was one of the most fun interviews I've ever done in my life. Like, I feel like I was more starstruck with the Muppets than the majority of actors that I've talked to. That was just so much fun. 
That's amazing. Again, yeah. the, the idea of like, oh, okay, so are you prepping questions for the Muppets? Or like, are they, they, or they're like, oh, here you go. We want you to talk about this. Oh, no, you're prepping questions for sure. When you're doing those types of interviews, you you have a very limited amount of time. Of you course. pretty much you walk into the room, you sit down, you're on camera, you start, you have maybe six minutes and you're done and you're out of the room and the next journalist is coming in. So yeah. definitely you go into those rooms very prepared with your questions because you don't have much time. Well, yeah, I also the Muppets, you know, someone, uh, you know, they're there. He's a frog, the pig, the bear, you know, Gonzo. They, you know, they, they got to eat, too. They're, they're busy people. Yeah. You know? But then how the hell does books and modeling and traveling and moving to Hollywood, Twilight, Muppets, how does that all equal back to Billy Corgan and NWA? Right. So I was a Smashing Pumpkins fan pretty much since I was a teenager, too. So I I always loved Billy Corgan's music. You know, it meant a lot to me as a teenager. And then um, I eventually was casted in a Smashing Pumpkins music video. That was uh, one of the... Con actually, no, that was not my first connection to Billy. My first connection to Billy was he actually played a concert at the building that I lived at, believe it or not. There was a radio... Excuse me. <laughs> No worries. That's the first there time I ever sneezed in an interview. So you've you've gotten a war today. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I, continue. I lived in this building uh, that there was a radio station in it, 98.7. So they used to have like private rooftop concerts in the building. And one of the concerts they had was Billy Corgan. So that was the first time I met Billy. I would I would like to say that's over 10 years ago. And then after that, I was cast in the Smashing Pumpkins music video. And um I became in touch. I came in touch with him again. And then a little bit of time after that um, was when I decided that I wanted to go to wrestling school, which is completely separate story from everything that we were talking about. Yeah. Uh, but it was in a situation again, where I, I was feeling depressed. I feel like a lot of things in my life happen in these moments where I feel like I have to reinvent myself. I'm depressed. I need to get out of here. I need to do something. And then I have this wild idea of something I've never thought of before and it ends up working out, which was kind of the the case with wrestling. I was watching WWE. I didn't grow up with wrestling. I didn't grow, grow up watching wrestling because it was not a thing in Brazil at all. Like my friends in Brazil still don't really understand the industry that I work in. Hmm. So I didn't, I didn't have that background. I didn't grow up with it. And I only started watching WWE maybe when I was like in my late twenties. Um, and so I was watching like female wrestlers that, I just felt super empowered watching them. And I was in a very low point in my life where I really wanted, again, to reinvent myself, do something different, accomplish something new. And I had the crazy idea, I want to become a professional wrestler. So pretty much I Googled, how do you become a professional wrestler? And uh, I saw, oh, okay, you have to go to wrestling school. <laughs> you have to learn how to wrestle. So mm -hmm. I moved to Vegas uh, to go to wrestling school. And uh, I lived there for about six months. Um, and during that time, um, Billy Corgan was, was following me on Instagram from the music video and saw that I was trying to become a wrestler. And so like that, we started a conversation about me possibly joining the NWA. So I had, a, I was already, I had already been in school for six months, I think when that happened. So pretty early. Wow. And so now your position really, um, went from wrestling to you know interviewing so where does that happen because obviously you said you were six months trained to be a professional wrestler six months that wasn't six weeks six months and yeah. now now you're in nwa interviewing professional wrestlers why yeah. why the transition i also trained for six more months after that i had oh. six months six months in vegas and six months in la um but yeah I think it came uh, from the pandemic. I was in a completely different role before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And then things changed. Uh, the wrestler that I worked with left the company. Um, and we didn't work for over a year. So I think once the show came back, Billy wasn't sure which, where, which position he was going to place me in. And yeah. he just kind of thought, let's try this out. You know, she already has a background in interviewing. And we started just trying it out. And it pretty much worked out. So he's kept me in the position. I've been in it for three years now. Wow. So yeah, because I, again, it's, so now it's one year of wrestling training and obviously the pandemic ruins a lot of things for a lot of people, but uh, you seem happy and you're, you're happy where you are in the NWA doing yeah. what you're doing. Yeah. 
I, I love it so much. I I think that, yeah, it's the right role for me uh, because I have all the experience, but I get to work with like everybody, you know, I have, to, I get to work with every single personality. And I think that's my favorite part of it that I get to interact with every wrestler and every storyline. And I, I'm just really happy doing it, honestly. And that uh, wrestling wedding on NWA Power, that was... Uh... I love NWA so much because of the fact that they're taking chances after the pandemic. It took a long time to get the ball rolling again, but having that wedding segment on a live NWA power, like what's that experience like for you being live versus being taped? I enjoyed it so much. That was my favorite day in my entire time in wrestling. Um, And we actually had a really big crowd that day. I, I would like to say it was one of our biggest crowds and the crowd was really hot. So that really helped. So I feel like that was maybe my first experience with live wrestling where I could mm. really feel the crowd's energy and it it helped me perform. So I really, really enjoyed that feeling. Yeah, that was a quite a fun show. And again, NWA has do, been doing so much. I've interviewed, you know, Tyrus, Aaron Stevens, the man who's breaking hearts. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh... A lot of great talent there. And I, I've talked to B- Billy many different times. So we, NWA is doing great business, especially I think moving from fight back to YouTube was the right decision for wrestling fans, because as I, we all know, there are so many streaming platforms out there in the world, yeah. not just wrestling, you know, everything is a streaming platform. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and what's funny is everything, everything's a stream platform. Well, why don't you put it all together oh, called cable, but we won't do that anymore. That doesn't make any sense. We all have to make our own money. But I got to say, your story, again, is in, is very inspiring because of everything you've gone through in life, the ups, the downs, the left, the rights. And what's next? What is on the horizon for you? Because you've already done so much. So there is a lot going on for me, which is what I was uh, kind of talking about when I mentioned Playboy opening doors. You know, it, because I am in Hollywood, because I already have a, a background in so many different things, there are a lot of new opportunities rising for me. Like I have new management now and I have a PR team. I'm setting up an actual structure now. And uh, I've received like numerous opportunities with modeling and brand deals, you know, and pretty much the month of February, I was featured on E! News. I was on Perez Hilton. I got a lot of press and I got a lot of uh, new opportunities coming from that. Um, I can't really talk about them yet, but lots of big things that could potentially be happening now. And then also I do want to get back into hosting and I want to get back into hosting in Hollywood. Well, I think the world is yours if you want it because you've done so much already in life. So give the rest of the pie of the life to you. Myra Diaz Gomez, thank you so much for being here on Ten Count. I really appreciate you sharing your story today. I've been Steve Fall. She's doing so much in the world, people. Let let the good vibes keep coming. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.